Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second meeting uh, in this uh, book club. Um, thank you so, so much for joining. We have an incredible day ahead. Um, I know that two hours sound like a long time, but actually I think that we'll be really running short on time. So I'll keep my introduction ex extremely brief this time. And so just to perhaps like, um, yeah, orient ourselves a little bit. We're currently at chapter three, which is on chapter meet the players, value diversity and Pareto tropism. And we're basically be introducing the concepts that values differ, that there's different value conceptions. Um, and then the concept of Pareto tropism as something, a guiding principle of some civilization or a guiding heuristics of our interactions so far and how we can actually enhance this dynamic uh, to enable Pareto preferred uh, interactions across humans and ultimately uh, AI um, players and how and what that could look like if extreme growth comes into the mix, which is something that Juan will talk about a little bit today. And then we will ultimately be introducing uh, in the next few chapters technologies that allow us to do this much better, which are technologies of cooperation. Uh, we'll go through economics um, and then we'll see how crypto commerce can actually further our peritotopian ascent um, and, and which we can just improve these technologies of cooperation uh, over time and what that means when ultimately we also add AIs into the mix. We'll also discuss risks and existential risks that could arise from cooperation uh, and so forth, but that's in later chapters. Today and in this chapter that I'll be sharing in just a second, we're really only laying the foundation of really how it is that um, uh, our values evolved, how it is that they may or may not differ, and um, what that means for the future of uh, our, the evolution of our values. And then uh, we introduce the concept of paridotropism and paridotropia uh, as like a kind of heuristics to navigate, um, to navigate in between. And so first we'll be joined by Jason Alexander. Uh, and Jason Alexander used to be uh, the head of my philosophy department at the London School of Economics. And he is a really wonderful, wonderful philosopher and uh, is using um, really wonderful simulations of uh, different, um, different agent-based um, yeah, interactions on how to actually figure out the, like how did, our, how did our values become the way that they are? And from the evolution of human values and our values were then go to like the limits to values and to the future of values with David Mannheim and Andrew Sandberg. Uh, and there we'll be discussed a little bit, okay, what can we look ahead? And then finally, we'll be joined by Juan Benet. Um, um, and uh, he'll be discussing the model of uh, Paradotopia as um, yeah, a heuristic um, which can guide our interactions. Okay, that's enough for me. Uh, I'm super, super happy. We'll be diving right in. I'll be asking a few prompt questions. As always, please ask the questions away in the chat. I'll be sharing again the chapter B that uh, today's discussion is based on. And I'll be asking a few questions. Uh, whenever you want me to stop talking, just uh, um, ask your own questions away. And we'll be going in intervals one by one. Uh, and I'll yeah, be trying to moderate it a little bit. Mark, you already want to say something? Yeah, um, just I saw in the chat, uh, Alan Karp asking about a Pareto tropism versus Pareto optimality. Since we sh shifted terminology partway through, I think it's it's important to have a quick clarification on that. Uh, so the familiar term, so familiar terms of Pareto optimal and uh, a Pareto frontier imply an end state or an equilibrium. And when we started first talking about this, when Drexel and I first started talking about, uh, we were using the term Pareto topia, which also implies an end state. Uh, I've sh uh, we've since shifted away from that terminology completely. We never say Pareto optimal or Pareto frontier or Pareto topia. It's now Pareto preferred and hill climbing and, um, uh, and Pareto tropism uh, because it's always a dynamic. It's always in motion. It's never about reaching an end state. Wonderful. And you already uh, are kind of like, Racing ahead, and the discussion on really when we we, we will be discussing peritotropism, peritotopia, um, it kind of like really in, at, towards the end of the, at this meeting with Juan. But first, let's perhaps start at the beginning, uh, and that's uh, you know maybe take a quick look at how did our values um, evolve the way that they are currently. And so I'm really really happy to have Jason Alexander here. Jason, thank you so so much for joining. Could you perhaps and I'll share perhaps um, your book here as well on the chat. But could you maybe give a brief overview of what evolutionary game theory is and how it helps to shed light on questions of morality and what are its limits really in helping us illuminate questions of morality? 
Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alison. Um, yeah. Happy to do that. So to begin with evolutionary game theory, I think it's helpful to break that name down into the two component parts, first evolutionary and then second game theory. Um, beginning with game theory, game theory is the study of problems of strategic interaction. Uh, the way to think about this is that some choice problems that individuals face are, pro are what are known as um, problems of parametric choice that doesn't actually involve any strategic consideration. So for example, if you're a farmer and you have to try to decide what crops to plant, you make a decision based on your beliefs, your information, your assessment of probabilities, but it doesn't actually involve an agent or another person who's trying to out with you. If you think about uh, games of uh, strategy like poker or chess or uh, others, whenever you are making a decision about what the best thing is for you to do, you have to take into account the fact that you're playing against a rational opponent, right? Just, or someone who's trying to outwit you in their decisions about what the best thing to do is. Now, we arrived at evolutionary game theory because population biologists in the 1980s realized that evolution essentially presents problems that have a game theoretic structure to competing species, even though none of the uh, creatures involved are actually rational. So if you think of like predator prey systems, the optimal things for predators and prey to do really depend on th their behaviors and so on. And that involves a kind of strategic interaction that has very much the structure of, of games. Now, this is relevant for the evolution of morality because what evolutionary game theory gave us was a whole set of tools and methods for thinking about these interaction problems and economists took methods of evolutionary game theory and brought it back into the social sciences to study questions of how people interact. And so, for example, if we're interested in how cooperation evolved, if we're interested in how fairness evolved, uh, if we're interested in how systems of punishment evolved, we can use these methods to study how groups of individuals interact, how they learn, how they modify their behavior, and over time, how we can see certain systems of cooperation and fairness uh, come about. So that's uh, a very a very quick summary of, of evolutionary game theory. Uh, if you want, Alison, I can send you some links after this session that we can distribute to people if they want to go and read, read more. Yeah, wonderful. I, I mean, you already showed us a bit of a simulation that you had. If you care for it, would you be interested in just, you know, giving a quick overview of this just to give people a flavor of what this actually looks like to model it, like morality out yeah sure so let me just uh, share the screen um so that people can see this so here's a very um kind of stylized very simple uh, uh evolutionary game theory model of say how a, a norm of fairness can come about this is a very simple uh resource allocation problem the idea is that two people have to share uh some some good so think of it as like uh splitting a dollar between two people. The the choices that people have is how much of the dollar they they want as a as a fraction. And each of them have to decide independently how much of the dollar of the fraction of the dollar they are going to demand. They can their demands can range anything from asking for nothing to asking for the entire dollar. But the rules of the game are such that if two people meet and their demands are incompatible. Say, for example, if I ask for 50 cents and you ask for 75 cents, those incompatible demands lead to a conflict. And when a conflict breaks out, no one gets anything. If our demands are compatible, say yeah, I ask for 25 cents and you ask for 50 cents, then we each get the amount that we have requested. Now, what this model shows is a very simple population. Uh, if you look at the, the plot on the right, the colors represent different strategies in terms of how much the dollar people want. So you can see the legend down here. Um, so think of this as like uh, how many dimes a person is going to ask for, ranging from nothing to the entire dollar. The edges here represent connections between individuals. Uh, you can think of this particular diagram as a spatial model, but you can think in generally that anytime you've got connections of acquaintances, friends and so on, uh, that the connections are supposed to represent the relevant social interaction for all of the uh, pairwise interactions. And what, what we do then is we imagine that people play the game with everyone they're connected to in the social network. And then at the end of every interaction, they compare the total amount of money they've received with that of all of their friends. 
and they learn by imitation. So everyone wants to adopt the strategy used by people around them who did the best. And what we can do is if we imagine to have running this over time, we can see what strategies end up evolving. And so if you look over time on the right, you see that this green uh, strategy spreads to take over the entire population. And if I scroll down and show what that is, that is demand five, you know, demand five dimes out of the dollar. In other words, the 50-50 split is what ended up evolving in this case. If I were to reset the model and do it again, you see that the 50-50 split emerges. And the reason this is interesting is because if you think of this particular problem, how should people divide a dollar when they have these independent interactions? We have a very strong moral intuition that in perfectly symmetric inter situations like this, share and share alike is the right thing to do. And what this particular model shows is learning by imitation in these structured populations is such that that always comes about. Now, uh, if you take a look at the link here in the, the chat, I'll copy this and put it in the chat so people can go and try these simulations out. If you look at other kinds of game theoretic problems, like of cooperation, trust, and so on, you can see that very often the pro-social behaviors are the ones that actually evolve. And so what this should suggest is that uh, interactions with you know, kind of people who belong to your relevant social network, your relevant reference network of people who you interact with, combined with certain learning rules such as imitation, generally have a push towards pro-social behaviors that we have now kind of incorporated into our moral systems as what we think about as the thing that one ought to do. Wonderful. I think that's a great segue into my next question. Which is, you know, I think in the book that I also shared here in the chat, you talk about the functional role of morality, right? And so maybe you could say a little bit about how is morality useful really as, like, to individuals as a pretty fast and frugal decision mechanism that helps us satisfy our preference over the very, very long one. How can we okay. think about it in that one? Okay, so the, the particular meta-ethical view that I described to you, that's the, the theory of what morality actually is, uh, thinks of morality as a kind of social technology. It's a way of trying to adjudicate conflict that exists in populations. So if you think about this from, like an, econ from an economics point of view, we all have our particular preferences over things that we want, right? Both over the short term, the medium term, and, and the long term. And the thing is that whenever you get a group of people together, not all preferences are capable of being simultaneously satisfied. I have certain things I would like to, to realize that are incompatible with your demands and vice versa. And the view that I argue for in the book is that morality provides a system of rules or a kind of a schema that when people follow the rules of morality, it produces an outcome so that as many people as possible can satisfy as many of their preferences as possible, given the constraints placed by the existence of others. And so morality can be thought of as kind of a set of boundedly rational heuristics that when followed, provide a way of smoothing out all of the uh, complications that are reduced, that are introduced by incompatible preferences in a population of individuals. And so some of the things that are kind of interesting with that view that I think tie into the themes that, that uh, may come up later in the discussion is that the rules of morality as a result always need to end up uh, being viewed as a system that is not complete. They always need to be thought of systems that are under revision and that will be evolving. Why is that? Because the kinds of interdependent decision problems that we all face in, in society are themselves changing. The things and the, 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 the questions we face and the complications we face now are very different from what people faced 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And the kinds of challenges that we face right now are going to be very different in kind from the ones that people have faced 200 years in the future. This, the system of morality that we have designed now works reasonably well as a way of adjudicating these differences, but certain revisions will need to be made in order to take care of potential new systems that happen uh, you know, down the road. Now, there are some other things I can talk about, about the view that this gives about morality, whether there's an objective sense of morality or not, but um, maybe I can see what, what direction you want to go next, Alison. 
That is exactly another segue into the next question. I think it, it fits in very nicely in the sense that, um, you know, how really is your understanding really of, uh, of morality in this sense? How does it inform questions about objectivity and relativity of values? I think in, okay. you know, part of the book really claim that good is relative to a society, maybe at a place and time, but it is still somehow objective. How can you square the two? Okay, good. So the, the view of morality that the comes out is that morality ends up being relative to a particular context, to a population, to a time. But it's important to, to realize that, that doesn't mean that the rules of morality aren't objective. Let me just say a bit about that. So I think quite often people think of, of objective and relative as if, if they were antonyms. But I would just like to point out that strictly speaking, that's not correct. The antonym of objective is subjective, and the antonym of relative is absolute or universal. And so when we think about systems of morality, we really have, if you like, a two-by-two two matrix of possibilities where we've got objective and subjective versus absolute and relative. And now if we think about how that kind of serves a, as a map of possible moral systems, traditional moral systems based on, say, religion, right, would be natural candidates for being viewed as a system of morality that is, conceives of itself as objective and absolute. It's absolute because there's a single universal moral law prescribed by God, say, that applies to absolutely everyone. Now, cases where people are worried about moral systems is fall into the category which is subjective and relative because a subjective view is something like a matter of taste. It's com completely dependent upon the individual and when you have something that is subjective and relative, that creates the concern that people have about morality just being anything goes. Whether or not it's actually possible to have a, uh, say, subjective absolute moral system, there's an interesting question about that. Um, there are some systems of moral belief, I think one is called Thelema, it's also an interesting thing to discuss I think, in the Satanic Bible, where you have uh, do what thou wilt shall be the only rule of law. And so this is interesting because if that's correct, you've got an absolute principle, do whatever you want. And so it's absolute, but everything is completely relative. Anyway, the view of morality that I tend to favor is one which is objective and relative. And what that means is that you have systems of belief that are relative to a time and a place, but what you ought to do is objective because sim you as an individual cannot change the thing that you ought to do simply by changing your mind. Think of it this way. Is there a objectively correct way to speak French or German? Yes, right? I mean, you there's a particular system of rules that are in the language that tell you what it is to actually speak French or German, and you can't actually change that system of rules by simply changing your mind. Uh, but at the same time, what it means to uh, you know, speak French or German is relative to a particular time and place because languages evolve over time. It would be a kind of a misuse of language to say, well, um, it's not the case that there is an objective way to speak uh, German because it only depends on what people within that particular community do. Well, that ends up, I think, being very similar to how we ought to think about morality. Moral systems are relative to times, places, cultures, and groups. But they are objective because the rules apply to everyone in that society. They emerge from that society, and no single individual can change the rules simply by changing their own particular mind. Okay, wonderful. I have a lot of questions in terms of you know what that would mean for our lives, you know, going forward, and especially the technologies that we discuss in the book. I also uh, perhaps just want to give some space for David, um, Anders, uh, and Juan to just introduce like a few. Uh, uh, bullet points before we actually open it up a little bit more uh, to the discussion. Um, thank you so, so much, Jason. That was a really wonderful, <laughs> wonderful introduction. 